In this lecture, we are going to start discussing ways to characterize what we know about our portfolio. Now, most people usually just skip to a mean variance optimization, but I think there are more fundamental questions to ask. For example, given a set of assets, what is the highest return I can achieve? What is the lowest return I can achieve? In this lecture, we will answer these questions. Let's start by considering the maximum return on a portfolio of assets. As you know, the return on our portfolio, given a weight vector w, and the expected returns mu, is just the dot product of w and mu. So you might say, just use calculus to find the maximum. To be clear, we're trying to find the maximum of mu transpose w with respect to w. That is, what value of w will maximize this function? However, this doesn't work. Why? Well, for several reasons. First, the maximum of this function is infinity. You can imagine that this is like a plane, or in one dimension it would be a line. Lines can go on forever, so the maximum is infinity. Second, this disregards one important fact, which is that the sum of the weights must equal to 1. Otherwise, it's not a valid portfolio. In actuality, this is a different kind of optimization problem. Instead of just having a function to maximize or minimize, we also have constraints. In general, we call these constrained optimization problems. We can state our problem as follows. We want to maximize mu transpose w with respect to mu. This is subject to the constraint that the one vector dotted with w is equal to 1. Note that this is just a fancy way of saying that the sum of all the elements of w must equal 1. In optimization, we like to represent every equality and inequality in terms of vectors and matrices, since that's eventually what we need to put into the code. So the one vector is just a vector containing all ones. You can verify in paper that this is the same thing as saying that the sum of all the w sub i's must equal 1. Also, since there's no way for me to bold these equations, I've subscripted the one vector with a d to make it more obvious that it is a vector of size d containing all ones. Now, if we stare very hard at our new problem, we will notice one unfortunate fact. It still has a maximum of infinity. To see this, suppose we just have two assets with returns minus 0.1 and plus 0.1. Well, we can obtain a positive return by shorting the first asset and going long on the second asset. For example, let's say we put minus 100% into asset 1 and 200% into asset 2. In this case, our return will be minus 1 times minus 0 0.1 plus 2 times 0 0.1, which is equal to 0 0.3 or 30%. But why can't we be more extreme? How about minus 200% in asset 1 and 300% in asset 2? This still sums to 1. In this case, our return will be minus 2 times minus 0 0.1 plus 3 times 0 0.1, which is equal to 0 0.5 or 50%. Obviously, we can just keep increasing the amount that we short on the first asset, and then we'll have more to invest in the second asset, which will keep increasing our return. So this is not good. In reality, we often have additional constraints on the weights of our portfolio. For example, we might say, don't invest more than 30% into any particular asset. This will keep your portfolio diversified. We might also say, don't short any more than 10% on any particular asset. In many cases, shorting isn't allowed, period. For example, your boss may simply tell you, no short selling. Remember that short selling is risky. One reason why this is, is because you can theoretically have an infinite amount of losses. Why is this? Well, if you purchase some shares of a stock, that is, you take a long position, and that stock goes down to zero, then you will lose your original investment. So if you go long, then the maximum you can lose is your entire investment. But when you short sell, remember that you're betting on the stock going down. If the stock goes up, you lose money. And since there is no limit to how high a stock can go, there is no limit to the amount of money that you can lose if you short sell. That is to say, you can lose more than just your entire investment. 
All right, so we would usually like to have additional constraints on the weights, not just that they should sum to one. So here's an example of a constrained optimization problem with more constraints on the weights. This time, we still want to maximize mu transpose w with respect to mu. This is subject to the constraint that the one vector dotted with w equals one, and that each w sub i is greater than or equal to zero. And by the way, we have a special name for this particular kind of optimization problem. We call them linear programs, or LPs for short. The reason these are called linear programs is because they are optimization problems where the objective is linear and the constraints are also linear. If either of these were nonlinear, then it would not be called a linear program. We will see a few examples of that later in this section. From here, it's easy to find the minimum return as well. We simply switch the max to a min and the constraints remain as they were before. Okay, so now that you know what a linear program is, how do we actually solve them? Luckily, there are libraries in many programming languages to help us do this. In Python, we use the linprog function, which is included in SciPy. So the linprog function works like this. Firstly, by default, the linprog function does minimization and not maximization. In SciPy, the function that we want to minimize is C transpose x with respect to the vector x. So if you want to maximize, you just pass in the negative of C. This is subject to several constraints. First, we have inequality constraints. We say that AUB times X must be less than or equal to BUB. Second, we have equality constraints. We say that AEQ times X must be equal to BEQ. Finally, we have bounds. We can say that X must be bounded below by L and bounded above by u. Note that just because SciPy gives you these options, it does not mean you have to use them. For example, you may not have any upper bound on your variables, so you can just leave this argument as the default, which is none. You may not have any inequality constraints, so you can leave those as none. In other words, you only have to specify the parts that you actually need. Now, using SciPy's definition of a linear program, it might not be clear how exactly we can implement our problem. We have that the sum of the weights must equal to one, but this constraint doesn't seem to be compatible with what SciPy gives us. In reality, we just have to stretch our imagination. Suppose that we have three x's, x1, x2, and x3. These all need to sum to one. Let's say we have a matrix AEQ equal to a one by three matrix of ones. Finally, let's suppose that we have BEQ, a one by one matrix containing just a single one. We can see that by using the constraint AEQ times X equals BEQ, we get exactly that the sum of the X's must equal to one. In fact, if you look at a more typical definition of a linear program, like what you would find on Wikipedia, it would look like this. As you can see, there is only an inequality constraint and no equality constraint. In addition, there are no bounds. There is a constraint that x must be greater than or equal to zero by default. In general, there are some tricks you can apply to convert inequality constraints into equality constraints. There are also other tricks you can apply to convert upper and lower bounds into inequality constraints. So everything we can do in SciPy can be converted into the format that you see here. This is typically something that you would learn in a course that focuses on linear programming, convex optimization, operations research, or management science. Luckily, SciPy makes things a little easier for us by giving us more flexibility in how to represent our constraints.